Morning, everybody. Listen, if, if we just found a seat on the outside, it'd be great if you could move into the middle so we can focus the group just a little bit. My name's Russell Willing. I'm from the Department of uh, Sustainability, Environment, Water, Populations and Communities. Uh, it's my pleasure today to introduce Deputy Chief Dennis George Kish and uh, of the Wamindji First Nation and Dr Monica Mulrennan who are going to talk about uh, Indigenous Peoples Protected Areas in Canada and lessons from the James Bay Cree community at Wamindji. Thank you. Good morning. Um, my name is Dennis Georgekish. I'm the Deputy Chief of the Cree Nation of Wiminji. Before I start, and bear with me, it's a custom in our in our traditions, or in our uh, in our language, to acknowledge a new place that we go. What you come say? Let's come now. Thank you. The Cree Nation of Women G. The community of Wiminji is from the, the northern Quebec, Canada, a population of 1,300 people. In the Mogadou River of the east coast of James Bay, this is where we live. In some ways, Wiminji is no different from a small town. We have virus facilities like a small town, sport, sports facilities, school, center, a cultural village, and a shopping mall. And we have our own hydro mini dam in the community. And, the full, and we, we call ourselves Iyuj. We are the Iyuj. In our language, it means the people. We have attachment to our past and we keep our traditions alive. We, the Iyuj, continue to practice the hunting and fishing and trapping to sustain our ancestors for many generations. Today, within our community, a third of our population still live off the land. We still carry on the traditional activities and events. In the spring and fall, we hunt and fish, and some of us still practice the traditional ceremonies. Our elders keep, keep our tradition alive through stories and legends. That makes our, our nation so unique and strong as people. Most of the lakes and rivers and mountains have a name and a story associated with it. Many stories are told by the elders, knowledge of which we have passed on through generations. And today we have a presentation, the work that we do, we did, on the protected areas in our territory. Wiminji is one of the commun nine communities of the Cree Nation of 
in the Cree Nation in Northern Quebec, Canada. And we have a few of my uh, fellow Crees here from Canada. They all work in, in the same in the same areas of protecting our traditional hunting grounds. The, before we start our our presentation, our workshop, we're going to show a video of the community. In uh, the size of the community, we're going we're going to hear from our our chief, Rodney Mark. Is, part of the video and here's something now here's our video 1975 the first James Bay hydro project a symbol of Quebec sovereignty for us I've never considered that there were indigenous people named Cal Crees that lived on that land we call it, it was a wasteland to us it was not a wasteland it supported our families this is where our traditions, our customs came from. It's going to be a long and bitter fight. And there's going to be a, a power confrontation between the free people and the government of Quebec over this river behind me. The 1975 settlement promised the Cree $130 million for over 80% of their land. This huge reservoir, almost the size of England, has drowned miles of river valleys that once supported the Cree. The hydro network is still expanding. New agreements with Quebec and Canada are providing the Crees with additional finances for governance and economic development. So that's the school. And this is a recent building. It's brand new, practically. It's a multi-daycare service center for the elderly and disabled. So that's our new administration office. That's the arena. It's open during the summer for a hockey school program. So this is the new clinic. <clears throat> it's going to be housed with a hopefully better service. The money the Cree received has had an impact. Today, unlike many other northern communities, they have access to decent housing, schools, and recreation centers, all administered by a sophisticated leadership. Well, this is going to be my fourth year as chief, yeah. but I was a deputy chief for six years. Prior to this. We know there's going to be development taking place. Development has been happening in our territory. Of course, there's still frictions between communities and developers. The thing is, we don't want to be confrontational, obviously. I mean, it doesn't end. I mean, I think the only people that really ultimately benefit out of that is lawyers. <laughs> but, I mean, I think our approach was going to be balanced, proactive, and try to be as positive as possible. Development pressures haven't let up. Hydro-Quebec's demands to flood more valleys for power are relentless. And now, gold, diamonds, and uranium have all been discovered on Cree territory. One time in Montreal, I'm having a meeting and we're talking about protecting the environment. And the following day, I'm having a meeting with the mining company and I'm just, where do I fit in in all of this? It is a very schizophrenic um, uh, approach. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> oh, look at this one. There's still a large fraction whose livelihood and whose life and whose meaning in life is on the land. There's nothing else that really matters that much to them. So these are people who are very seriously devoted to uh, working out an appropriate balance between uh, development opportunities and, uh, and environmental protection, which for them is not just about environment in the abstract, it's about their way of life, it's about a, a, a very large part of their way of life and the survival of their culture. Good morning. Um, I'll pick up the story from this point. Um, on the map that you see uh, before you is a map that outlines really the, uh, the impact of the uh, 
hydrological diversions that occurred as a result of the James Bay project. Wimbinji Crees were fortunate in that the area in the rectangle um, includes the two largest watersheds on the Wimbinji traditional territory. And these areas, these two watersheds, because of their intermediate size, were of less interest to Hydro-Quebec and for that reason were left relatively intact. And um, these rivers are of particular cultural and historic importance to uh, the Cree, uh, Wiminji, and ecologically fundamental to the continuation of hunting, trapping, and fishing activities. They're widely regarded, these two particular rivers, as the lifeblood of the Wiminji territory. The areas to the north, to the south, and further inland have been impacted to quite an extent by hydroelectricity activity. But as I say, those two watersheds, the Madiscao and the Pocumshamwa, have been, are relatively intact. Um, but a decade ago, the community became increasingly concerned about the protection of these two watersheds. A wave of development activity was uh, associated with mining, as mentioned in the video, uh, was just about to, to ramp up. Um, and in fact, in this uh, slide, you'll see the, uh, the dark blue is the area impacted by the hydro development, but the orange, um, the significant orange uh, patches on the map are uh, exploration permits that were issued by the Quebec government without any consent from the Crees. So there were literally hundreds of these mining exploration permits um, approved and uh, increasing concerns within Wiminji about the protection of those two watersheds. Um, Colin Scott, the anthropologist from McGill that was shown there in the video, and myself, um, I'm a geographer at Concordia University, also in Montreal. Uh, we were known to the community and were approached and invited to work with the community to find a way to, um, to really ensure that, that those two watersheds remained intact. We recognized that the, um, that the expertise of others were, were needed and we called on the support of colleagues and um, built up an interdisciplinary team. Um, let me go back here. The, um, the team, uh, a research partnership was formed with the, uh, the leadership of Wiminji, um, the coastal tallymen, the, the stewards responsible for um, the, the hunting territories in, the, in particularly in those coastal areas, um, also um, a team of uh, 20, well, 10 uh, researchers and 20 graduate students were brought on uh, from a range of disciplines, including archaeology, anthropology, geography, biology. We even had a philosopher, two philosophers, I think, included. Um, and the partnership extended at the regional level to the Cree um, Trappers Association, uh, to the Grand Council of the Crees, to the agencies responsible for protected area development, both at the provincial and the federal level. Um, and we worked with uh, one NG an ENGO in particular, CEPAWS, the Canadian Parks and Wilderness Society, um, and um, the funding for the particular research collaboration that we developed was largely through the uh, Social Sciences and Humanities Council of Canada. And we managed to secure about 1.5 million in, in funds for this particular project. In terms of the research that was conducted, uh, ideas that were generated, the, a kind of a two-way learning to to really strategize as to how we could protect those two watersheds in the midst of such a powerful pre pressure, particularly from the mining companies. Um, as I say, the, the relationship was very much defined, the, the research partnership was very much defined in terms of that two-way learning, uh, was community-based, very much an agenda driven by the, the Wiminji community. Um, land-based learning, like really being out there on the land, hunters talking to biologists, um, um, 
a lot of uh, training aspects, particularly for women GUs uh, included in the project, a lot of youth particularly involved in the archaeological component of our project. Um, inclusive, we, anyone who was interested were hired on as research assistants and informants and research collaborators. Flexible in terms of the type of research people were interested in and the type of connections and involvement and sustained. This was not the type of research where we flew in, flew out. Um, it was, it, in fact, it's ongoing. This project started over 10 years ago and continues. Um, back to the map. Um, the area that was identified for protection, as I mentioned, is those two watersheds uh, to the south, the area closest to about 100 kilometers from the coast. Um, and um, even as soon as we began thinking about protected areas, we discovered that a mining claim had in fact been registered in the middle of, and in fact in, in, around the old factory lake, which was, is really the gem, the, very much the, the core area of the biodiversity reserve or the protected area as it was that we were, that we were talking and thinking about. Um, and this proved to be uh, an interesting um, problem because uh, there was no there was no ability for the the, the Greens to um, to nullify that that permit. But as the talks, as the proposal for a protected area gained momentum, it became clear to the to the gold mining company that had that had registered the claim in the middle of this proposed uh, protected area, that it wasn't in their interest to pursue that. And in fact, ultimately, they did withdraw that claim and that area that is shown in orange in the middle of that lighter green shaded area where ultimately a biodiversity reserve was established, that was withdrawn and the area um, became part of the biodiversity reserve that was established in 2008. So through the research team, through this collaborative partnership that was established between um, academics and uh, the, the community, um, this proposal went forward and was accepted by the ministry responsible for protected areas. In terms of designation, there was, there was very little on offer. I mean, there was some talk about indigenous community conservation areas around in the mid, well, 2007 to 2008, but of course they don't have any legal teeth, and here we were facing a problem of mining moving into an area that needed protection. So the community decided, with the support of the Grand Council, to go for an accepted designation, and that was the Biodiversity Reserve, which was an established protected area type that um, Quebec was uh, availing of at that time. Um, this just gives, uh, just to give you a sense of the kind of controversy around the mining claim, the, the, the kind of response from the Crees and how that generated enough um, uncertainty around how that mining claim might proceed for the company ultimately to withdraw it. By 2008, through the Wiminji Protected Areas Partnership, we managed to have this biodiversity reserve um, accepted. As soon as the proposal was accepted, an automatic moratorium on further mining was immediately put in place, um, which really achieved the, the fundamental goal of uh, excluding um, external development on that particular part of the territory. The area that has been protected within this biodiversity reserve is about one-fifth of the Wiminji traditional territory. It's an area of about 4,700 square kilometers. It includes, as mentioned, the two key rivers in the territory. Um, and it, um, it is a, it's, it's a protected area designation that wasn't um, an automatic fit for the Crees, but at the same time, the ministry has shown some willingness to, uh, 
to work within, um, to work with free interests and management authorities. So it, it seems so far to have been a relatively good compromise and certainly achieved the overall purpose of preventing development on the, um, on the watersheds. Um, in terms of the guiding principles, um, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to turn. I don't have my glasses with me. I didn't realize I'd be at such a distance from the, uh, from the screen. But um, in our discussions, the discussions, the many discussions we've had as a, as a team, um, a number of guiding principles were worked out for how these protected areas would proceed, regardless of what designation we had ended up using for the protected areas. Um, they were to be... Um, framed by free knowledge and values. Um, sorry, that they would obviously contribute to the enhanced protection of the area, was, which was the, the fundamental objective. That they would pro prohibit um, external high impact development. So no more hydro development, no more mining, no more um, uh, large scale activity on those watersheds. Um, that they would contribute to and enhance local authority over those areas and local management, and that they would, um, uh, in, in terms of their management, that the Cree would have a leadership role in terms of uh, the management and the monitoring of those areas, and that they would, uh, that there would be, um, they would in no way reduce, in no way impact on the ongoing land-based activities of Crees in terms of hunting and fishing, um, and indeed that they would support some low-impact development, perhaps in the form of tourism. So back to that map again. The, the light green areas I've mentioned has been established um, as a biodiversity reserve. And like many Aboriginal uh, groups, particularly in Australia, that connection between land and sea is a very important one for uh, James Bay Crees. We had initially uh, assumed that the biodiversity reserve would extend, or the protected area on the land would extend into the offshore and respect that continuity between land and sea that is reflected in Cree tenure, Cree knowledge, Cree stories, Cree place names. But given the jurisdictional complications in this uh, area where the land is under Quebec uh, jurisdiction, the waters are under federal jurisdiction, and indeed, it's even more complicated than that because the, um, uh, none of its Inuit actually have administrative um, roles in the offshore area, particularly over the islands within the James Bay area. And uh, so they were another party in terms of uh, interest in the, in the area. When we started discussing the protection of the offshore, it was immediately clear that the community didn't just want to have uh, a small extension to the biodiversity reserve. They wanted all of their, all of the Wurundjeri offshore territory protected. And this satellite imagery, uh, imagery it doesn't really do justice to the richness of this area, but there are these hundreds of embayments along the coast that are extremely productive hunting, uh, fishing, ecologically very, very rich areas. In fact, many of them have been recognized as important bird areas. Um, the two larger islands that you see there, the twin islands uh, to, the, to, the north, uh, to the northwest, the, these are recognized as wildlife sanctuaries and are particularly important because they are the, um, the, the home areas, the habitat of the most southerly most southern population of polar bears in the world. A really interesting um, genetic uh, a cluster of polar bears that uh, uh, about 100 bears in that particular area and of particular importance given climate change and other environmental changes in the, in the subarctic. Um, the area is also important as a beluga sanctuary. In fact, the beluga population, which is a, a small uh, white whale, some of you will be familiar with, um, it, uh, it's a healthy population unlike the population of Beluga further north. So for all of these reasons, uh, Cree's recognized the importance of protecting this area because it has become increasingly accessible in recent decades and there are concerns about maintaining 
um, the ecological and cultural integrity of the area. As part of the protected area, we, um, we, uh, w we did with, with the community, there was a lot of research done in terms of the ecological and biological significance of the area, reflected in the slide here, some of those activities. And this is a horrible slide, I realize, but I just wanted to capture just the richness in terms of pre-occupation and use of these areas. This is one of the very small embayments. Uh, the area shown in the slide is no more than four to five kilometers in terms of the distance uh, across the bay. And the number, uh, you know, the extent of the place names there reflected in the map, even if you can't read them, you can see that there is quite uh, a dense density of, of place names. Um, this map shows some of the more important uh, fishing sites and hunting uh, sites. So again, uh, tremendously important culturally uh, to the Crees um, and this area not just recognized as, as, as significant to coastal families but indeed to the entire community and not just the Wiminji community, indeed in recent years East Main to the south and Chisasabi to the north have indicated their interest in being involved in the protected area which is known as the Dowich um, conservation area, Dowich being a Cree word that kind of gets at deep water, the, the, the bay. So in terms of a proposal for protecting this area, we again were limited um, because of the, the lack of legal teeth um, that uh, an indigenous community conservation area would, would give. We have been looking more towards the um, available designations for protected areas and the more suitable one seems to be a national marine conservation area. So at the moment there are some talks that are underway with Parks Canada about the um, possibility of this area being an NMCA. The area that has been um, proposed for protection is over 20,000 square kilometers, so a very extensive area. Um, and just a few others. So in addition to these two protected areas, the terrestrial one has been, uh, it is in place. Uh, it seems to be working, working well. Um, there is a proposal for a major marine protected area um, that has stalled in recent years because of um, when we began this process 20 years ago, Aboriginal um, title in the offshore was, uh, um, hadn't, been, hadn't been resolved and in more recent years, in fact in 2010, a uh, land claim agreement uh, in relation to the offshore was uh, negotiated and that land claim agreement, like most of the land claim agreements in Canada, includes very particular provisions for the establishment of protected areas. And now that that land claim is, is beginning to take shape and the infrastructure is evolving relating to it, uh, the, we're seeing um, the possibility of the protected area moving forward given that the infrastructure is now in place. So in addition to the protected areas, some of the other outcomes of the uh, Wiminji protected areas has been the type of research collaboration uh, centered on the archeological component. Um, the community really got very, very involved, particularly a number of the youth uh, in this particular project. Many of the artifacts ended up uh, giving a basis for establishing a museum that would be, uh, that is located within the community. It's a virtual museum. Many of the place names that we've recorded and the stories are also uh, part of that particular um, um, museum site. So this just gives a sense of what's available in terms of the recordings and you can click on the place names and it brings you to uh, an explanation of the place name as well as any stories attached to it. Um, the Rodney Mark, the chief, was very keen when we began this work that the, the youth would be really very actively involved and many of the, the, the students that worked as part of the team um, became involved in an annual uh, science camp 
for the, the younger members of the, the Wiminji community. And here are some slides from, from that experience. And that's been ongoing. It's been a very successful program. There's also an annual canoe trip that the community has, has in place. And the, certainly the Wiminji Protected Areas Project has contributed to that in many ways and been a very nice reciprocal um, development. And the cultural center um, has really been a, a, a kind of a local uh, space where many of the, the outcomes of the project have been housed and have been available to members within the com of the community. It's there, this cultural center, to celebrate Wiminji, to, to build capacity for um, protecting the land, uh, particularly in in response to the type of con the type of pressures that uh, Wiminji is facing in relation to external developments, um, and then just uh, by way of conclusion, because uh, Dennis and I are keen to leave some time for for some discussion, just to point out that I think within a Canadian context, what we're seeing are really the availability of land claims and the inclusion of provisions for protected areas have have really facilitated the development of uh, partnership arrangements between um, governments and um, Aboriginal communities. Unfortunately, the lack of legal, um, we don't have indigenous protected areas, we're not sure where the indigenous community conservation areas will fit within the protected area landscape as it's evol evolving in Canada. Um, concerns about uh, development pressures, the need to have protected areas with legal teeth, um, are a, a limitation on what is achievable at the moment. But um, certainly other things that are working in favor of the kind of projects that we've been involved in, co the cooperation between the community level and the regional level, the Crees do that very, very well. That, that dance between the community and the regional level has really been a, a very effectively um, uh, worked through. Um, also what we're seeing in Wiminji, you know, the type of uh, community-based collaborative uh, engagement, the, their interest in protection at the same time as moving with some level of sustainable development in other parts of the territory. A lot of what's happening in Wiminji coincides with um, what's happening, or, or at least the ideas and best practices that we're hearing about um, at national and international levels. And I think we're seeing also some interesting um, an interesting role for academic communities and indeed for ENGOs in terms of their engagement with indigenous communities and, and how those partnerships can, um, can really facilitate uh, the protection of land, not just in a protected areas context, but in a broader conservation strategy um, uh, move also. So in the time that we have available, um, we're obviously open for any questions. This has been a fairly major project that we've only really had an opportunity to briefly outline here. So it was certainly available for, for questions. But we thought we'd throw out a general question to you as well, uh, which speaks to what barriers and opportunities exist for indigenous people to avail of protected areas to enhance local management authority over their traditional lands and seas. So we hope that by outlining some of the opportunities and some of the limitations that we've experienced at Wiminji, that maybe you can, uh, maybe we can facilitate a, a larger discussion on the role of protected areas, um, uh, and particularly as they relate to indigenous people's aspiration for land and sea protection. I'll throw that question back to you, given your work in, in my part of the world at Erwin and Torres Strait. Uh, what do you see as, um, I guess, ways that we can link up what you've learned uh, in Wiminji and uh, the work you've done in Torres Strait? Thanks, Kenny. So some of the parallels between um, 
the experience in Torres Strait for, and, and Wiminji, uh, I've worked, uh, I've been very fortunate to have worked with both communities. I think, I think the pressure is really how to get the balance that, that, we, uh, that Rodney spoke to in the video, you know, the need to engage in development um, and at the same time to uh, protect areas to ensure that the land-based activities can continue. I think that in Wiminji we're seeing the same kind of stresses and the same kind of demographic trends that Torres Strait Islanders are facing and the difficulty of knowing how to engage in the market and in development opportunities at the same time as remaining true to you know, that stewardship role in fulfilling the responsibilities to manage the land and sea. So that, those same kind of dilemmas and uh, um, difficulties are, are very much there and informing, you know, the kind of uh, strategies for moving, moving ahead. Yeah, thank you very much for the presentation. And my question is, you know, the biggest challenge uh, up to date, the biggest challenge is the erosion of the cultural, social, and the, you know, the traditional knowledge of, of these wonderful communities. So being one of the communities of a very, very developed country, so uh, how, uh, uh, is there any threat uh, to their culture uh, or to, to their social systems, or they are very much intact? If there is a threat, what are the remedies or strategies you are, you are, you are applying just to conserve first their culture and their, uh, what, what you can say, their social systems. Because if they are conserved and they are protected, then ultimately we can go for the protected areas and other things. Thank you. Hear the, uh, the whole question. What is the question again? Sorry. The question was to do with the cultures and how it's being preserved and not threatened. The question was, and the question is, because the biggest challenge is that uh, with a very rapid pace, the indigenous cultures their values, their traditional knowledge is eroding. So how, uh, what you can say, uh, uh, how severe this issue is in your community, in your area, and if yes, how you're dealing with that particular problem? Because if your culture is not intact, if your traditional knowledge is not intact, and if it, that is not protected, what to talk about the protected areas and involvement of the communities in the protected area management? Um, when, when you talk about culture, our, our way of life, culture itself, is very much intact. You know, the, the work that we do, like the protected areas, you know, the mandate given to the chief and council comes from the people. And the number one priority that's there is to protect the language and the culture. And sometimes, uh, what Monica mentioned, is sometimes it's very difficult for us in the leadership when we talk about protecting the land, protecting the culture, at the same time, you know, there's a lot of uh, development happening in the area, a lot of uh, companies that come in, and we try to sit down and try to balance, and uh, this is where it's difficult the culture itself and the language. It comes from the grassroots level where we discuss. This is very important where, where we can lose sight of who we are and where we come from. And this is, uh, this is still, if I understand the question, our cultural, our, our culture is very, it's, it's a number one priority and the, and the land that we live in 
like I said before, they, there's a lot of our people still live off the land from hunting and fishing throughout the year. Uh, Dennis and Monica, um, Wayne here, uh, Wayne Bergman from the Kimberleys. I um, just like to say, um, look, I, I've been up to Wimmersy um, and Dennis, I think, took a day to drive to Ferris Airport and get the plane to come over here. Incredible country. Um, I host, uh, the Kimberley Land Council hosted uh, the Deputy Grand Chief Ashley and uh, Chief Rodney Marsh from Wimmagee in the Kimberley and we had a look at a range of agreements happening and as an exchange I went back and Chief Rodney took myself, um, Kieran O'Barkley, um, Monica's husband, Colin and we, we did their annual canoe trip and it was an amazing trip because they've identified as part of their cultural preservation, uh, the way I've interpreted it. And it was like any other Blackfella trip, you know, that we have in the Kimberley. Rodney said, um, just down the road, just down the road, seven days later, I was still paddling that canoe. <laughs> you know, we're just going to do a quick trip over to the next stop, you know, by the end of the day. Um, we, didn't, we didn't quite make it, it was exhausting. But the most amazing country, we were, um, and storytelling in each location. And this is what kind of inspired me to kind of hopefully inspire some of our ranger groups. It was the traditional um, hunting route, uh, trapping route for trapping beaver, going up in the winter and canoeing down in the summer. And we came out at Old Factory Lake, um, and then it took another two hours on a very fast boat to get back to Wimmagee. And people stood up with their shirts on, and we were under the canvas with, with big jackets and everything and clothes. So um, th they'll have to come to the Kimberleys and have the opposite. <laughs> it's very hot. Um, so look, I, I kind of think uh, Wimmagee, I was in the community and blown away about I didn't hear anybody talking English. They all spoke Cree and then French. And then, because we were there, different people had to speak English. And the challenges the community had, like all of us, uh, alcohol, drugs, job, paddy crack job. And the big, one of the biggest things that I thought about this balance is when um, seal trapping or seal hunting was banned uh, for fur, it had a massive impact on the community because it represented a major part of the community's economy. People almost starved overnight because they couldn't get food and had no income. And it's kind of, this is the big picture of the reality of how, how do we build healthy communities? How do we maintain what's important for us? And uh, I kind of think, um, Look, thank you for coming over here and hopefully people will get to talk with you, Dennis, and share some of those stories. Um, yeah, and thank you to Wemmergy for your presentation. Um, my question would be to uh, Dr. Monica. You mentioned about um, the um, sustained effort in research and consultation, and you went further to say that it wasn't a situation where people were flying in and flying out to service the community. So I'm just wondering, because you, you, you went further to say the gold mine of Bifton is broader tenement, so my question is how influential is that sustained effort um, hanging around for the long term, not flying in, flying out? We're not really hearing the questions very well up here, but the question was about in relation to the fly-in, fly-out kind of style of research that might have been done in the past. Was that, how do you do it differently? I'm sorry, if you can just. Uh, how influential was that, um, that 
effort on the, on the part of the people to stick to it and not be fly in, fly out. How influential was that effort in the gold miner pulling the pin? Well, we had a, a research protocol in place. Um, there was a lot of discussion before the project really got up and running as to how we were going to go about doing this research. And there was a real commitment on the part of particularly the academics that were involved. Um, you know, they were chosen fairly carefully. I mean, these were people that were interested in, in, in long-term engagement. And in fact, even though the funding, the major funding that we had for the project, you know, like all funding, has come to an end, it's interesting the extent to which um, most of those team members have remained involved. I, mean, I should say that Colin Scott, who was the, the principal investigator, has worked in Wiminji for 35 years. So, you know, to have one individual who has that a, a re really deeply rooted in the community made a, 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 a I think that that was important in, in terms of generating the kind of trust and ensuring that the research was done in the way that it should be done. We have one last question, and if we have time, we'll take a second. Uh, Nigel Cornwall from the IUCN's uh, World Commission on Protected Areas. And firstly, to congratulate you on a your excellent presentation and amazing work. Something I thought was interesting was the idea around the landscape conservation comes from pre culture and pre values. But you also made reference to the IUCN category three, which was the category which was applied to the park, but also the emerging idea of communities as stewards of formal protected areas and using MPA legislation and terrestrial legislation. But what I heard is also that the national legislation wasn't in step with that. So I was just interested in this relationship between indigenous ideas of integrated landscape management, land and sea management, international standards, which basically support the same idea. The Convention on Biological Diversity is quite clear that that's the protected areas should include culture, land rights, benefit sharing, involvement. But national legislation is often out of sync or it's out of timing. So maybe some comments on, did the community look at multilateral and international agreements? Or how did you navigate that space between the international level, what local people really wanted to do, and then how to deal with different levels of government in Canada, what that was like? I think in the early days of the project, we had a lot of very interesting discussions, and we had um, followed fairly closely what was happening in terms of the indigenous community conservation areas, and we saw that as being a potential model. But then we ended up with this very, very real pressure where we, le we needed something that would impose a moratorium. So a compromise was really taken at the community and I guess at the regional level as well to, to go with something that would, that would give uh, the, the kind of ability to block development. So it was all very well for us to think in terms of a much more appropriate, culturally appropriate model. But given the kind of pressures that the community was under to, to find something that would stop development in those areas, um, we had to go with the compromise of whatever local designation was available. Now for the offshore, I think there is a, there's less immediate uh, pressure to, to put in place the National Marine Conservation Area, but there hasn't been very much progress made within Canada in relation to marine protection. Um, I think less than one, less, certainly less than 2% of Canada's marine areas are under protection. Uh, Canada's doing better in terrestrial. I think we're closer to the 12% target. But um, the NMCA, the National Marine Conservation Area, that, that act is fairly limited. Crees only recently, as part of the land claim agreement, got title to the islands. Um, so they're certainly on, not very interested in giving up title to become part of a national marine conservation area. And the idea would be that if that model was to be pursued, it would, the waters which are under federal jurisdiction would be where the national marine conservation area operates, but the islands would retain Cree title. So there hasn't been, I mean, we've been looking to the international level and seeing some really interesting developments, 
But on the ground at the moment in Canada, our options seem to be fairly limited. Um, and particularly at the moment, the federal government seems to have very little funding and not an awful lot of interest, I would say, in, in, in some of the types of conservation um, uh, initiatives that uh, indigenous people are, are, are pushing. So um, that, that's really where it's at. And, and, and certainly one of the very interesting things about this conference is the extent to which there is discussion of alternatives. We're very interested in the IPA model that Australia has been availing of and uh, I look forward to hearing what's happening with the ICCC, the ICCCAs as well. Unfortunately, we've run out of time. Uh, we've got about 10 minutes to move in this session. So uh, if you could show your appreciation of Venice and Monica, that would be a good question. Thank you very much for us.